Hi, everybody. Uh, just to introduce myself real quick, my name is Jared Krzyzewski. That's a long last name, I know. Jared Krzyzewski. Uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I am a 3D concept artist. Uh, I've been working in the film industry for the past uh, three, four years. Uh, I've been uh, lucky enough to work on some very exciting projects that are coming out this year. Uh, I'll just uh, kind of take you through uh, some of my work and we'll talk about a little bit about the process. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into uh, uh, some creature sculpting techniques. Uh, I just uh, was lucky enough to go on stage uh, beforehand, so I'm uh, nice and warmed up. So it's, uh, it's a good place to be. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit about why I prefer to use a ZBrush and 3D uh, in a uh, concept production environment. Um, one of the reasons why we love using ZBrush uh, at uh, the Aaron Sims company is because clients get a very realistic looking uh, concept, photo real concept. Uh, and that helps directors and producers uh, really um, clarify what they want in their mind. Sometimes they have an idea, but uh, they really need to see something highly realized. And uh, just over the years, expectations for realism have gone up as uh, CG uh, characters become more real. That expectation goes all the way down the line. And now concept artists have to do very realistic uh, looking work uh, in order to sell the product. Uh, what's fantastic about ZBrush is this model can then be passed down the pipeline and then animated, rigged, uh, you know, all these things. So the the lines are starting to blur between ideation and production. And uh, I've kind of been uh, fortunate enough to witness this firsthand. Uh, so here are some uh, various designs, all using 3D, all using ZBrush. Uh, and then I will uh, render this out in an external program, sometimes Maya, sometimes Keyshot, or sometimes I'll just do a ZBrush render. Uh, and then uh, taking it into Photoshop for a composite, and then uh, we pass this uh, right off. So uh, here are some uh, additional pieces. Uh, I did fan art for a while. So uh, uh, here's Crumb from Ah Real Monsters and uh, Kif from uh, Futurama. Uh, so here's uh, some like mechanoid uh, type of uh, things and then just uh, more weird creatures here. Um, oh, and I'll go ahead and uh, show you uh, some additional stuff. Let's see. Uh, this is... Uh, a troll design I did for the direct TV commercial. So the troll has to be uh, kind of a handsome father figure, I guess, for a troll. And uh, he carries his iPad out to go get milk uh, while he's uh, getting milk for his baby. Uh, so here are the uh, expressions, facial expressions that I did uh, as a test. And uh, you, know, you can see just uh, how easy it is to make this character emote and express. Uh, in various different ways. And uh, this uh, concept model that I did later went on to Method Studios where they uh, you know, uh, prepared it for their pr production pipeline. But the design to the final image is uh, almost one to one. Uh, so you can see here's the uh, design sculpt. Uh, another way would be uh, to call it would be digital maquettes uh, would be another good way. Uh, but yeah, uh, once this uh, design is approved, it just passes right down the pipeline uh, for the modelers. Uh, it's just fantastic. Uh, here's another piece done in ZBrush and Keyshot. Uh, another uh, fan art piece of uh, Kang and Kodos from The Simpsons. Uh, another uh, weird, bizarre alien creature. Uh, this was a student demo. I'm also an instructor at uh, Noman. Uh, so this was a demonstration for students. Uh, and uh, here is the actual uh, sculpt of this guy. And, uh, you know, this is perfectly ready for 3D printing. Uh, so this is another fantastic thing about uh, ZBrush, is that uh, not only do your uh, concepts get ready to go all the way down the pipeline, but you can also print these out for clients now, too. So uh, the rise of 3D printing is, uh, is just super exciting for a digital artist who we don't often get to see are things uh, you know, uh, physical in front of us. There's a kind of detachment of uh, the physical and uh, the conceptual. Uh, so now with 3D printing uh, being uh, so widely used, uh, those gaps are gonna narrow. So pretty soon we'll have a 3D printer on every person's desk 
and I'll be able to uh, sculpt something out, send it uh, as a physical uh, uh, print to a client, and then they can uh, approve it or not approve it. And then uh, it's just getting much easier to mass produce these things. So uh, you can give them all out to your clients as gifts, you know, you know, celebrate your product and celebrate your design in an interesting way. Uh, it's just super exciting. And now I guess they're printing in color, which uh, is just another huge leap. Uh, so we're just going to watch these gaps between designer and and uh, you know final production models like these gaps are just going to narrow as we uh, as we continue on and uh, so recently I did the work uh, did some designs for uh, I Frankenstein did these a few years ago uh, regardless of what you think of the movie I have uh, I always have fun uh, designing for projects uh, so this is all using ZBrush and this is actually a ZBrush render uh, and this came uh, ZBrush actually came out with the surface noise plugin right as this uh, program, uh, uh, as this show was coming on. So you can see using uh, the ZBrush Noisemaker is how I was able to achieve uh, some of these deep cracks. And um, it, it's just awesome because, uh, you know, to, to sculpt something like this, you know, by hand would have, uh, you know, taken forever. Uh, so ZBrush just has the tools that uh, someone like me needs, uh, and you can just ideate and come up with stuff very, very quickly. Uh, so here you can see a turnaround of the head. Uh, they wanted uh, these kind of engravings carved in there as well. And these cracks are, uh, you know, using that surface noise plugin. Uh, here's another design uh, that I did with uh, another artist, uh, Brian Wynia, uh, another fantastic uh, conceptual designer. Uh, so he did the base sculpt and then I uh, rendered and then uh, added, uh, you know, some additional cracks in there as well. And uh, this is pretty, pretty close to how the final design uh, for the gargoyles turned out in uh, I, Frankenstein. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, they just, they just fell in love with it. Um, so here's an earlier pass of uh, uh, the gargoyles where they were more dog-like kind of things. Uh, so early, uh, just like cracking, and then uh, this is uh, some Photoshop manipulation in here as well. But uh, the clients love this stuff. And of course, the clients are going to change their mind here and there, and, uh, uh, but with ZBrush now, it's so fast to ideate and uh, come up with this stuff. So very, very fast and um, very professional, very photoreal uh, concept design. So it's no longer a guy sitting uh, with pen and paper on his desk. Uh, you're physically modeling something. And this is perfectly ready to go to print. Uh, this is in a, in a totally good place. And so now, not only do you have a conceptual design that can be done within a day, two days, uh, but then you can also print these out and then uh, pass this on uh, to your client uh, until they're satisfied. So it's a very, very cool time. And then uh, pretty soon we'll see toys being built in this manner. Uh, very, very, very cool. Okay. So I'll get ahead and uh, get on uh, with some of the sculpting features. So uh, basically uh, for today's demonstration, I'm going to basically use this essential uh, model that we were using for the... Uh, uh, live sculpt demo. Uh, so nothing, you know, particularly new or different here. And I'm just going to grab a basic material to start off with. And because I'm not limited by uh, print size, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, delete this guy right here. So uh, one thing I like to start off with is just a basic sphere or a, a basic primitive of some kind. Uh, and really, the gap between digital clay and real clay is shrinking. Uh, it feels more like uh, real clay now uh, when uh, ZBrush advented uh, uh, with the advent of Dynamesh. There's no limits in topology anymore. There's, the only limit is really your own imagination, uh, which is just incredible. Uh, before, uh, you know, uh, to model out or sculpt something, uh, it could take a day, it could take a week. It was a very time-consuming process because you're, you're learning to put points and in space at any one time. Now it's just very natural, and it's amazing how technology has actually taken us back to those traditional methods. Of, um, so it's now a kind of a combination of the old and the new kind of married together, and that's, uh, that's why I love ZBrush, and it's uh, really incredibly fantastic. So what I'm gonna do, uh, just to start off, is I've got a little dinosphere here, and I'm just gonna start carving in uh, just some rough uh, lines. Uh, many artists kind of go in with a preconceived notion of what they want uh, beforehand, but um, not me. I kind of, uh, I thrive in the chaos. 
you know, so I like to, uh, I like to get my hands dirty, so to speak, uh, and uh, start just throwing in some general lines here. And uh, this is going to be the basis uh, for our creature. Okay, so just rough, you know, rough and dirty sculpts, right? Well, now with the move tool, which is just like if you were using your hands, right, your physical hands and you're, you're pushing and pulling clay apart, right? We're going to use that with the move tool. So I like to think of the move tool as my fingers as I'm massaging the form here. So I'm just going to really push and pull some shapes around until uh, I start to, uh, you know, uh, find something that's a really appealing shape for myself. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stick with uh, a creature theme, uh, just because I've already warmed up on creatures uh, uh, for the past week and then uh, uh, in the uh, live sculpt competition. So I just want to uh, stick with that theme and uh, start going crazy. So I'm just uh, roughing out a head here. And this is the part where you start letting those like little happy accidents happen. Uh, you know, you can see since I've kind of done some rough uh, marking up, I kind of have uh, an indication of what I can do. And all this detail will change uh, over time. I'm not married to any one thing because uh, in this digital age, you can change your mind at the drop of a hat. You know, if I want to really push and pull these forms around, uh, I can do that and not have to concern myself with proper topology or anything like that. You can change your sculpt on the fly uh, and really, um, really push and pull design now. Uh, I've had clients, uh, and if you don't like this, you can always uh, run backwards in time and, uh, you know, go right back to the beginning. But I'm going to go ahead and scrub forward a little bit. And I've actually had clients uh, sit behind me uh, while I sculpt uh, while I live demo and sculpt in front of them. And they love it because uh, a client actually can get what they want, uh, you know, very, very fast. And so I've had them, you know, sit behind me and say, like, oh, could you, you know, push this or, you know, change this? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, not a problem. Uh, just because uh, the nature of ZBrush is so forgiving now uh, to, uh, you know, to sculpt anything live or to sculpt something in front of a client. This is fantastic because they can get uh, exactly what they want. And uh, in this case, uh, because I'm, you know, just winging it off the top of my head, is I know that I'm going to, you know, essentially want to uh, sculpt out a genuine skull shape, right? And then, uh, you know, push and pull those forms until I find that skull is uh, generally appealing. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to mask out this section invert that, and uh, just grab this piece of clay. Now, masking is like if you were, uh, you know, to block off a section of your sculpt and then just push and pull some forms. So what I'm going to do is just grab this uh, just blank area here. We're just going to pull this down. And this is going to become the basis of our torso here. And all these polygons, you can see here, uh, it's very low resolution. These polygons are very stretched. Um, and actually, I'm okay with this. Uh, because this is where we get into those like little happy accidents that are going to start happening. And I l actually let this stuff uh, kind of dictate the sculpt a little bit. So you can see it, it looks almost like shredded here. But when I clear out the mask and then I re-dynamesh, uh, look at all these little like happy striation accidents that start to happen in there. Uh, dynameshing uh, as you go and as you're working uh, along, just uh, fantastic. And uh, I just love being able to just push and pull and let, and let the creativity happen. Um, a lot of the times, uh, you can really limit yourself by going in with a, a preconceived notion of, uh, of what you want. So we got our base blocked out here. And all these like little kind of... Uh, pokey things. I'm just going to let those fly, let those uh, be a part of the sculpt here, and just let it almost uh, dictate the design of the creature here. Just roughly sculpting in some just general striations. And if you were to look at my hand, I'm just kind of like loosely uh, noodling over it. And uh, letting things uh, kind of appear. 
Uh, one of my favorite words of all time is uh, called pareidolia. And that's, uh, that's a phenomenon where you, you see shapes and faces in like bushes and trees and hills. Have you ever like driven down a mountainside and you're like, hey, that looks like a creature stuck in that mountain. That's called pareidolia. And that's, uh, it's believed that we evolved pareidolia uh, to help se uh, separate environments from, uh, from people. Uh, but uh, today, I'm going to use that skill to like find a face in here and find some shapes kind of out of the chaos, out of the, out of the blackness of space. I'm just going to try and find something um, generally appealing here. And then I'm going to fill out the, uh, the back a little bit, just fill out a general uh, torso shape. And, uh, you know, we want this to be a really cool alien from uh, beyond the stars. So uh, give him, uh, you know, some shoulders and some identifiable features. Let's give him a neck. Let's work out the head. And I'm just uh, using my move tool. Uh, you'll find that the more you use ZBrush, the fewer tools you end up using. Uh, because the, the few tools that you have are so brilliantly useful. Uh, that you just, um, you can just, you know, bang out this stuff really, really fast. Uh, I was doing trial runs for the live sculpting, and I was finishing sculpts in an hour. And I was like, this is fantastic, because now I've got an extra half hour to, to start dealing, uh, detailing out stuff. Okay, so I'm just going to work out a little bit of uh, an eye cavity here. And I really want to take this guy into almost... Um, a realm of abstraction. Uh, you know, we've all seen the classic alien kind of face, right? When, when you think of a gray alien, what do you think of? You think of the standard, you know, large head, small beady eyes, gray skin kind of thing. Well, uh, nature probably wouldn't uh, develop anything like that. If, uh, if we were really out there on a, on a planet uh, that we've never seen before, we don't know what the structure of these aliens would even look like. Uh, so chances are uh, the human imagination just cannot conceive of, uh, you know, what could possibly be out there. Uh, but we're going to try a little bit, <clears throat> and we're going to use uh, ZBrush for that. So just squashing in the face, finding, uh, you know, those, uh, the structure within a sculpt. And that's what... Uh, that's what good artists do, is they, they find a lot of the structure uh, in their sculpt. Okay, so we're getting pretty cool here. What I can do is I can even mask this out and then push and pull these shapes a little bit more. Uh, and when you render this, it starts to create that dimension, that feeling of uh, you know, something sitting in, in three-dimensional space. So there we go. Nice uh, uh, clavicles here. Just work on the dimensions of the neck. Let's pull out uh, some cool forms there. And then uh, in my head as I'm talking, as I'm trying to figure this out, I'm trying to figure out who this character is. Is he an invader? Is he, uh, is he a scientist on an expedition of uh, uh, you know, discovery? Is he trying to, you know, is he trying to figure out uh, you know, who we humans are. Why are they coming down to Earth? Are they going to sap, sap us of our resources? Are they uh, here to study us and figure out who we are? All that kind of fun stuff. So now let's, um, let's grab this sphere here. I'm going to clone this out so I can work with this separately here. And I'm going to grab a piece uh, from their Insert Mesh Collection. And what's fantastic about the Insert Mesh Collection so say if I open up the dragon bones, all these pieces are just digital clay for me to, uh, you know, go ahead and, you know, do with as I please. And you can just draw these out all day and, you know, you have a, a nice abstract model. Not exactly what I'm going for here, um, but I am going to use this uh, collar bone piece. Okay. And I'm going to uh, just separate that out. I so, uh, want to make sure it's drawn directly in the center here. Great. So I'm going to isolate this guy. I'm going to delete anything that's not visible. So I just have this little collarbone kind of piece, whatever it is. 
And I'm just going to subdivide it once, twice, and then uh, I'm going to grab my handy-dandy rake tool. And just like a sculptor uh, would be sculpting on a traditional maquette, uh, I'm going to use this rake tool to kind of refine the form and add these like little bitty details in here. Ultimately, this is going to kind of shrink uh, down a bit. And you'll see where I'm going uh, in a moment uh, with it. Hopefully, it'll be Q. But just adding a little bit of uh, uh, detail here, just rough and dirty. Ah, you can see that uh, it was uh, projecting through to the other side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on back face mask. And if uh, I turn on back face mask here, you'll see that uh, as I sculpt through, even aggressively sculpt through, it's not uh, going through to the other side. So this will be especially handy with uh, 3D sculpts uh, or things that need to get printed if you only work, uh, need to work on uh, one side of the mesh. Okay, so just general roughness. I'm not looking for uh, perfection here. And because I did subdivide it a few times, I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to delete these subdivisions. And so now I have this just uh, little piece uh, built for me right here. And I'm going to turn this into something more. So also what's fantastic is not only can you get these like insert mesh pieces uh, like these guys, but you can also create your own. So uh, really, once you start doing this, sky's the limit on, uh, on whatever you want to create. So I'm just going to grab this piece, and I'm going to grab it from a top view here because uh, I want it to project down uh, into the mesh. So I'm just going to grab this. I'm going to hit Create Insert Mesh, and I'm going to create a new uh, insert mesh piece. So now when you see this, now I can just draw these out all day long. And now that I have this piece, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new sphere Right? Just a new polygonal sphere. I'm going to make it a poly mesh just in case. Uh, and now what I'm going to do is I have a custom menu set up for this. But what you can do is you can create symmetry, right? And we already know about left to right symmetry, but also we want to explore radial symmetry as well. So if I want to uh, turn on my radial symmetry, I'm going to turn on Z. I'm going to turn off X because I only want it in the Z. Uh, position in space, and I'm going to turn on radial count. So now I have uh, four little radial dots that you know travel around in a perfect circle, and this is where we really get to start uh, experimenting and doing some like crazy cool stuff. Uh, so I'm going to draw out four of these guys here, and then I'm going to draw out four more, and. Maybe another one uh, coming out right here. So now that I've got this, let's just say this is like uh, some kind of complex port or you know uh, something organic for things to pop out of uh, with creatures. I'm just going to take this. I'm going to delete this sphere here. And let's uh, delete hidden. So now that I have this piece, I can make this all one uh, unified piece. So I'm going to do that with Dynamesh. And uh, when you see me running around in the menus, it's because I've created a lot of custom menus to, uh, to help uh, speed up my workflow uh, you know, all together. Uh, because when you're doing this you know, all day in and out, you don't want to be digging through menus and you know, doing all this stuff. So I create a custom menu with all the, the main features that I need. You know, at some point, there's always going to be another feature that you need. Uh, so I'll just add it to the menu as I need. Uh, so now I've got Dynamesh. I'm going to crank up the resolution on this thing to about 512. And let's go ahead and Dynamesh this. So now what uh, Dynamesh is doing is it's taking all these pieces and making them one unified piece. So just from that one piece that you saw, now I've got two new pieces. There we go. So now we can see that this is all fused together, right? But this is a bit heavy. Uh, this is, you can see this is about 800,000 uh, polygons here. And if I were to start drawing this on top of a character, uh, the poly count would just jump exponentially every single time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a zebra mesher function on this guy. And uh, man, when, when uh, ZBrush developed the zebra mesher, uh, man, did they knock it out of the park with this thing. Because uh, 
topology uh, and retopology was the uh, just a, the bane of every 3D artist's existence. And uh, when they developed zebra mesher, man, they just there was a collective sigh of relief across the industry as we no longer had to deal with like push, you know, putting little points every single place. Can you imagine how long it would take to retopologize something like this? It would, uh, it would, to do this one piece alone would have taken me a week, two weeks, three weeks, who knows. Uh, but now I just hit a button and uh, I can talk to all of you while this is going on. And ZBrush is just going to figure out uh, the overlying topology of this thing just based on the curvature of the surface. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just genius, mind-blowing. Like we were, we were all blown away when we saw this for the first time because uh, now you could retopologize a good model, have that ready, ready to go to production. So now sculpting from the mind, retopologizing it, sending it off to production. Now look at this. Look at how clean this is. This is incredibly clean, and I can guarantee that if I had tried to do this uh, you know, in another program, it would have uh, taken you know, just forever. So we went from 800,000 polygons to 20,000 polygons at the push of a button, and while you hear me go blah, 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 blah. So now what's cool is I'm going to take this piece and turn this into an insert mesh. I'm going to create an insert mesh brush. And now what I can do is I can append that to my original brush. And now you can see that I've, uh, when I hit the M key on my, uh, on my keyboard, that I can now switch between this guy and this guy. So let's add like some weird crowny type stuff. Uh, to this guy, switch out to my other tool. And we can just really start doing some really bizarre uh, aliens that we've never seen before, just using this kind of weird, uh, fun stuff. And again, even though these are correctly topologized, I'm not worried about this because I'm just going to turn it into a DynaMesh. So now switching between the kinds of meshes that you have, you know, from DynaMesh to, a, to uh, you know, a proper topology mesh, then back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so the type of mesh you have no longer matters because those rules are, are meant to be broken now. So I'm just adding like this crown of like little weird, like poppy kind of bizarre things coming off this guy's head. And uh, letting uh, symmetry kind of like do, do its, its own trick. But yeah, well, you can see like when we start to combine these methods together, uh, it just really turns into something special. So now maybe it's like some like porous, uh, you know, weird creature with, uh, you know, some kind of afro or something. I don't know. But even after we've done this, we can grab our move tool, grab these all together, and start pushing and pulling these shapes now. Remember, there's no limits anymore. There's no limits. There's no limit to what the imagination or what digital media can bring now. So you can just really push, uh, you know, push the boundaries now. Like we're, we're at a technological age where we're watching all these kind of boundaries break down bit by bit. And that's because uh, that's of uh, hardworking uh, engineers and designers and, uh, you know, programmers, you know, all, you know, coming up with the... Um, with the tools, so you know, a, a dumb artist like me can just uh, go crazy uh, creating things, and uh, I just love it because the rules are are they don't exist anymore. There's no more rules for it. So if I want to create the uh, weird Afro puff alien, I can do that. So let's uh, continue to do some of this stuff here, just refine uh, the forms, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and re-dynamesh this guy. Let's uh, push and pull those uh, head shapes a little bit. And let's uh, re-dynamesh. And look at that. Now all, this, all these little pieces are now a part of the mesh. And to sculpt something like this on your own uh, by hand uh, would have you know, taken forever. There we go. And you can see, like, all these pieces now have their own polygroups, so if I want to work on a section at a time, you know, I can break it down, work on one part or another. I'm just going to go ahead and group this all together as one. 
And you can see like my poly count, even, uh, even though I have all this uh, stuff going on, is only at 150,000, so that's nothing. And uh, you know, the, the kinds of detail that uh, 3D printers can get now I, is just mind blowing. I really uh, was not uh, prepared, even coming here today, uh, to see like how uh, good the detail is.